talk with us about proficiency-based standards and grading. Absolutely. If there's any other opinions you'd like, just ask me. I, yeah. I've yet to run out of opinions yet, so. Yeah. Okay. Do you have a testimony that we're looking at? Yeah, um, I, I think Colin's emailing that um, okay. assistant opening statement, really. Okay. Because I thought that they'd be mostly questions and okay. answers. So, but good afternoon. I'm Don Tenney, 31 year veteran teacher of English from South Hero uh, and current president of Vermont NEA. Uh, last June, I completed my 16th year of teaching at BFA St. Albans. So in addition to teaching and working at various um, levels within the NEA, I also served on the Vermont Task Force for Teacher and Leader Effectiveness, uh, which is the group which wrote the guidelines for teacher and leader evaluation, uh, and also served on the Vermont Standards Board for Professional Educators for four years, and served as chair for two years until I left that position uh, to take this position last July. Uh, so I appreciate being invited to speak to you today about proficiency-based graduation requirements and to offer the perspective of a practitioner who has lived through the implementation of this new approach to learning, instruction, curriculum design, and assessment. I have a few reflections to offer about the experience of a classroom teacher, but would like to allot most of my time to answering any questions you might have. Uh, to start, I would like to recall that the genesis of this new approach came from the pre-K-16 council a few years ago. It was not generated by classroom teachers, nor was it based on student performance data from the field. Uh, it was based on theory and theoretical research from a variety of sources. Actually, one of my former uh, superintendents, Robert Rosane, was one of the people involved with the council at the time and one of the proponents of a proficiency-based system. While it is beyond the scope of my testimony today to review the entire history of this system to figure out how we got to where we are today, I think we should refer to the Vermont State Board of Education Rule 2120.8, Local Graduation Requirements. You can see that there's a very basic requirement the graduation credits, quote, must specify the proficiencies demonstrated in order to attain a credit and shall not be based on time spent in learning, unquote. I am personally unclear about how we went from that simple rule to making the wholesale changes we have made in some of our schools, including entirely new grading policies and systems. Our members are experiencing a very broad spectrum of new programs and policies with a new proficiency-based system. Now, it's a cliche to say that the devil is in the details, so I'll say that the snafus are in the implementation. Anyone would be hard-pressed to find any two school districts that have implemented this new approach in the same way. The anecdotal evidence we have gathered reflects the variety of approaches each school district has taken. As I've been asked about our members' experiences with PBGRs in the last couple of weeks, I realize that we do not have adequate data or evidence to reach a conclusion about the effectiveness of this new approach. At our next Board of Directors meeting this coming Saturday, I will be asking the Board to authorize some type of survey of our more than 13,000 members to ascertain where they stand on this issue and dive more deeply into their experiences. If you have specific questions that you would like answered, I'm more than happy to include those on the survey and report back to you at a later date. I would rather not reach any general conclusions without gathering more evidence from our members. One area of serious concern that I have heard from members is the change in the grading system and the subsequent confusion. For example, in my school district, the curriculum coordinator announced that the state of Vermont had mandated that we change our grading system from the traditional ABCD system to a four-point proficiency system. I do not know the source of his confusion, but neither the AOE nor the State Board of Education ever issued this mandate. Somewhere along the way, however, many districts followed the same pattern and began changing the grading system, the report cards, and the transcripts. This has been a great source of confusion and consternation on the part of our members. One of my colleagues, a math teacher, 
has calculated that she spends four times as much time calculating her grades than she did in previous years. This also creates an awkward situation for teachers who are teaching dual enrollment classes since they have to follow the requirements of the Community College of Vermont, which are not consistent with the high school requirements for grading. I also wonder how much money school districts have spent on software systems that have been designed to manage the new grading practices. This might be an area that your committee would like to investigate further because thousands upon thousands of dollars are being spent on software that is not being spent on books, materials, and services for students. Maybe school districts should be required to report the per pupil cost for these new software programs. I believe we have work to do in assessing this new approach. How will we know that the PBGR approach is effective in improving student learning? How will we know that this proficiency-based approach is effective in dealing with the issues of equity? Will this lead to our students being more successful in college and in the workplace? I have yet to see any statewide or district-wide assessment plan of this nature. In closing, I want to express my concern about the very high stakes decisions that will be made next year regarding whether or not students will graduate from high school. How will we know that every school has policies and programs in place that will allow these decisions to be made with fidelity? If there is doubt about the efficacy of this new approach, I ask that you consider extending the deadline to the class of 2022 or to consider other options. Thanks, and thank you, and I'll be happy to entertain any, any questions. Questions? Uh, just a quick refresher. Do I recall correctly that it was the State Board of Education by rule that adopted this timeline? Is right. that correct? Yes. Yeah. As far as I know, it was not, not legislative. It was part of the State Board of Education. Thanks. Um, the, so the, the deadline is similar to the question I had. So the deadline was the State Board of Education, but there is <coughs> legislation that mandated the change in general, if not the deadline, correct? That you'd have to review the 77. Flexible pathways. Flexible, Flexible pathways. pathways. So <coughs> what was the, I, I'm a new member. Uh, I'm hearing skepticism maybe on your part of, of what kind of data was really behind that move. Is what you're saying today consistent with testimony that, that this committee might have heard from the NEA or other other individual teachers during the development of flexible pathways? I'm just kind of wondering: Is this? I'm not aware of how much testimony was taken from classroom teachers during that time period as it was being developed. There was not much teacher involvement at all when we created when the PBGR system was created. Along the same time as flexible pathways. But that's one of the, I mean, one of the issues, by the way, is that there's been so much focus on the grading <coughs> problems that PLPs, right, which are at the, at the root of flexible pathways, have taken very much a back seat because everybody's trying to figure out the, how, how to come up with grades with transcripts. So it's, there's two different things happening, right? There's, and, and PBGRs have taken really all the energy and time. And so are your comments more, more directed towards the PBGRs yes. and the PLP? <coughs> more, more, yeah, I, I have been at, questions are being asked of me around PBGRs and, and I think that's what started this discussion as well, is around the PBGRs um, as opposed to the PLP and flexible pathways. Because um, you can certainly have flexible pathways um, without changing the whole grading system and, and saying that you're quote unquote proficiency based. We've been, you know, as a teacher of English, I've, I've been teaching writing as a proficiency based program for years, right? We take the process approach. There are multiple opportunities for students to demonstrate they are proficient at writing. Uh, if we go back to the portfolio system that some of us remember, um, and the, portf the writing portfolio was a proficiency based system. Right? And, and a very good one, because what it did was that it, it influenced the behavior of the teacher. And so the teacher actually assigned more writing because those folders, those portfolios had to be built. 
So it was a very effective proficiency-based system, even though it wasn't called that. Just a quick follow-up. Um, we had testimony, please, anyone on the committee correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe we had testimony from the, the head of the Vermont Principals Association last week, um, kind of expressing that moving to personalized learning uh, <coughs> evaluations did not necessitate moving away from a traditional GPA right right so how does how does that square with what you're saying or does it not square with what you're saying because I would think if we're retaining the ability to have a more traditional grading structure a, a four point grade structure essentially uh, how how is that different from the PBGR and I, I may just be ignorant here well, there doesn't have to be that distinction, right? I mean, you, you can build the proficiencies into the curriculum and maintain the traditional grading system. So a student can still get an 87 or a 94 or, or a 62 and just barely pass. So one does not dictate the other necessarily. And that's, and to, to be honest, I was not in the room, wherever this room was, when that decision was made that all of a sudden we had to change this entire grading system. And, and just a bit of a caveat, when we're, when we're talking about fours now, four, three, two, one, it's not the equivalent of what we know from college getting a 4.0, because a 4.0 is an A, right? The, the 4.0 that we talk about now in, pro, in proficiencies, levels of proficiency is around um, exceeding proficiency. So a three means the student is proficient. If you translate that to the traditional system, that could be anywhere probably 75 to 87, 88, somewhere in there. So it's, it's, not, it's not quite the same as just thinking, transferring it to what we know as a, you know, like a 4.0 system. I don't know if that makes sense. But. Mm -hmm. So we're all still just recalculating anyway back to a system that we were familiar yeah. with when uh -huh. we were students. Right, and, 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 and I think it's, um, no one really demonstrates that why that system is bad. The bad part of that system, which we actually started dealing with at our school, was when you use a 100-point scale and a student doesn't turn in the work and I give them, okay, you didn't do this, you're getting a zero, right? And then even if, the, if he gets 100, the next assignment, now his average is 50, so he still is failing. So I think what we realize, if we talk about the power of zero, that's easily abated because you simply, if you don't turn, your, your failing rate is a 50, right? Um, and then your average would be 75 in that case. One of the problems is today, and this I, I've heard from a number of educators, there's no immediate consequence for students who don't do the work now. And they're leaving it for the end of the term. They're, they're not keeping up. We're told, you know, well, you, the pop quiz in an English class is no longer acceptable because that's somehow grading compliance, et cetera. That counts as a transferable skill. And so what happens is students feel that they have all these multiple chances to prove they're proficient um, and as a result, they don't keep up with the regular work. So you're suggesting a, a one-year delay. What would happen? Well, with, I would actually yeah. suggest that a two-year delay. Two-year two, two delay. I'm so used to one-year delay. We've been talking about one-year delays in here for quite some time. So you're suggesting a, a two-year delay. What would happen in that two years? I would, for, I would envision um, rethinking some of the processes I, and I and you know there there may very well be plenty of schools that are ready to go now that they feel that their system is in, has been in place a while I think some schools were already proficiency based and, and systems were um, working much better than others I think the two-year delay is for those who haven't quite got there um, and I think that that what should happen is really studying is this does this grade Right? Or does this assessment really demonstrate what it is that we want to demonstrate? And that's, I don't know that everyone has that answer right now. And I, the other piece is, do we know what's going to happen in January when that high school senior has not met the levels of proficiency? Right? What's going to happen in, in June? Right? And, and are they then retain for another year? Is there summer work? How, how does that happen? And that, 
those things are just being put in place in, in many schools now because it's been, you know, I think 2020 seemed a long ways away when it was first introduced, and so I think we're, we're catching up. But this was 2013. It would take, yeah. right, but, but, but those students weren't even in high school, right? So it took high school folks a while. But, um, so, and again, I'm, I'm speaking from my, my personal experience and a few folks that I know, and, and I really think this, the questions that I've received from the press recently and, and coming here today real, realize we really need to know more about what's, what's happening. Because, you know, one of the things that I learned when I was um, on the task force for an evaluation, we always talked about, well, and I'm sure you've heard this plenty, you know, Vermont is committed to local control. Right, and we then you know push for a statewide system, and as we know that that has its pluses and minuses. So and there's so because of the inconsistency, because there's no template that districts have done as they've seen fit. Not necessarily bad, but we just don't. It's harder to get a handle on what the experience is across the state. When we say it's all over the map. It is all over the map. <clears throat> uh, in terms of taking uh, the concept of a survey to your board, uh, would you uh, prefer that we wait to see the findings of that survey? And if so, about how long would it take for you to get a full data set? Um, I don't know the answer to that, how long it would take. We, we're getting much better at surveys because of the technology that we have. Uh, and we have, of course, access to so many uh, educators. Um, I would prefer that if there are questions that you folks know that you have now that you really want to know, for instance, did you feel there was adequate professional development offered in your school district as you were preparing for this, which probably will be a question we ask anyways, but if that's the kind of question, let me know and we will put that on the survey. Uh, and then get back in. And I think turnaround might probably be a month or two, given, you know, we're, we, as you're probably well aware, we have been surveying them a fair bit around our healthcare issues, and we've gotten ter terrific response to that. I don't, I don't know how, if it would be as quick and as complete as, as that one was, um, but we, we're pretty good. Given that we are a citizen legislature and coming from all different backgrounds. I'm just wondering if there would be the possibility of having maybe a group helping to advise on what those questions would be. Well, like I say, we're, we're um, I, I'm committed to having the survey done for our own mm -hmm. use. Uh, and, and so my offer was that if you want us to include questions, we can. I don't want, I mean, it, I think that would be a little more efficient rather than the legislature now, you know, requests a survey or a study committee. I think okay. we can do it quickly. Thank you. I'm glad for that clarity. Yeah. I, I know the students in the school I was working with really did not like proficiency based um, ways of measuring. They just felt like it was good practice. You know, to, I mean, like people were saying, well, if a kid gets a C and they don't know what the C is for, well, that's just not good teaching practice. You know, good teaching practice is you've had four conversations with that student mm -hmm. when you're giving them a C and very clear rubrics or very clear right. directions on what they need to do. And I remember reading research that said that um, the more words there are in an evaluation for a student to use, the let the let it's not as easy as getting a grade because the grade is so concrete. But it's not just the grade. So again, the teaching practice is having a lot of talking time with the student to explain right. what where they are, what they need to do, what they need to work on. And so I, I know they were very concerned about and this was a long this was, you know, probably seven years ago. Mm -hmm. I first started. Uh, yeah. Because right. it's so subjective. Right, and you're absolutely right. I think what, whatever the grading system is, to be fair to the student, the student needs to understand what that grade is based on. Yeah. And if if they don't, then you've got to wonder what the point is. I remember um, Sue Bingham, who was a wonderful uh, reading specialist and worked in the AOE for years, just a 
very brilliant woman. Um, and I remember a conference where she said, the only rubric a student will understand is a rubric the student helped create. Mm -hmm. So one of the uh, things that I always did uh, in writing and public speaking classes was to work with the students and write the rubric so they internalized what the standard was and they knew how to get the A, B, or C. And so when they did get that C, they could go either back to the rubric where they had internalized, this is what it means. And also, the parents have an understanding of the ABC that they don't quite know what right. you know, not meeting proficiency necessarily means. I also thought sitting in on meetings with teachers when we had the portfolio, you know, the writing portfolio, especially and looking at student mm -hmm. work, the conversations were so powerful. When one, student, when one teacher gave a B and one teacher gave a B minus, and having the conversations, well, how did you get a B minus? Absolutely. You know, by looking at the same writing, you know, someone might give it a B, a B minus, a B plus, and those conversations I thought were so helpful for teachers. You're <laughs> absolutely right, and and it, which speaks to another issue, and that is around calibration, mm -hmm. right? And and when we, as we've moved to the proficiency-based system, it's relying upon rubrics and understanding what the standards are. One of the pieces that's missing right now is. Do we have cal are all our teachers calibrated mm -hmm. so that the score in my classroom is going to be similar to the score in the classroom next door? And without that calibration, no matter what the grading system is, um, you're, it's not fair to students because I can just go down the hall with another teacher and and get a different grade. Calibration takes time, and there's a lot of professional development involved in that, and, and we tend to not add that in. One of the things that I have heard, again, anecdotally, um, is that that's a piece that's missing, and that may be to answer your question, in those two years, that could be a more uh, robust effort in calibration. Yeah, I'd like to think if there was, was a two-year delay, that there was some um, active work uh, going on related to, to moving forward. Well, there hasn't been an absence of active work in mm -hmm. as we try to put this right. system in place. And, I, and I'm, you know, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention, you know, I work with colleagues who have literally been in tears as they've tried to make this system work and, and doing the right thing for their students because there's so much at stake for them. and. And the lack of understanding, and particularly for ninth graders and who have gone, gone home, and because they're getting a one or a two, because they haven't met the level of proficiency, they think they're failing the class, mm -hmm. right? And it's a real brutal way to begin one's high school career, thinking that you're failing the class because you're failing to meet a level of proficiency. For the traditional system, there are other grades to put in there to, make, to assure the student, no, you're, you're not failing. Here's some work that you need to do. So there are a lot of flaws in, in the system that will eventually, I'm sure, be, to be worked out and have been worked out in other schools. Are you aware of any places where it's being successfully implemented? Um, I think, I think there's such a wide range. I don't want to speak about any other school, although I, I'm, because of uh, friends and folks in our office, I, Williston has done a very, Williston has been a, has started years ago with a standards-based system, uh, and I think they have done some good work. Um, and yet, there, there's issues around, you know, different school. I don't even know if the whole district would say that. I know there's some folks who've done a lot of good work at Mount Abraham, uh, and they came and spoke with us. But again, they'll always, I remember one in service we had, folks from Mount Abraham, um, and they've done all this great work, we asked a few questions, and it was like, well, we haven't quite figured that out yet, right? So there are certain pieces that are, you know, we, we definitely are designing the, the plane as we're flying it. So just one quick question. Yeah. Do you see any consequences to a uh, negative consequences to a two-year delay? Personally, I don't. There, there, there may be the the oh my God, we've done all this work and now we we could we could have had an extra year or two years. I think would be the only one. I don't know what the negative would be. Um, there's a little bit of precedent in the sense that the state of Maine has just decided to make it optional as opposed to a delay. They said, well, well, we'll just make it optional. Um, 
which as I said, there, there are plenty of options of dealing with this. That was their choice. Um, and again, there were a lot of issues. That my counterpart remained of notice in terms of lack of professional learning opportunities, an incons again, inconsistency, uh, not clarity around what the standards are. Um, and I'm not sure if there was a more of a state top-down um, implementation. Um, it, maybe the AOE has talked to folks in I'm not sure. But so there's just such a range that it's hard to to say. And again, I would say that the, the delay says if you're ready, if everyone is confident, you know, it doesn't mean that they have to change. We're not asking. I'm not asking for the change at all. Although. I think it would be a tailored delay that you know. Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> Too soon. Well, that's, that's cool. I, what I also just want to do is maybe see if there's some off, uh, offline folks that want to, want to speak with you to, to develop this sure. thought. Um, then, but just, then, because we do have other testimony here and they're waiting. So, Representative yeah. Austin. Just real quickly, like one question I would have is do you have evidence based, like data, mm -hmm. to show that this advances uh, student learning? You know, and not anecdotal or, you know, just something very, very scientific um, evidence that shows. Because, I, again, as an educator, one of the things that concerns me about education is that we don't look at output. Right. You know, we look at input, we're going to do this, this, right. this, and, you know, we really need to, you know, with, like you said, for the money and time that people are putting into it, you know, we, we want it to work. Absolutely. Yeah, we can certainly ask if there's that, if they have that in place at yeah. their schools. Okay, thank you. I might see if we can get a little subgroup to take a look at this. <coughs> sure. Thank you very okay. much. Okay, you all know where to find me, so yeah. if you have those questions, so thank you. Brad James, nice to see you. <laughs> you think? Do you? No, yeah. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Uh, do you want this one up behind you, or do you want no, the other? No, the, the number one. of Education. I would just like to start off by saying I love parking in Montpelier. <laughs> I look forward to it every time I'm coming over. <laughs> every time. <laughs> I lucked out though, this time. <laughs> but when I was here at 9 o'clock, thinking I was meeting with you guys at 9 o'clock, I had a great parking place. <laughs> no, I, I, I mixed you guys up with uh, Ways and Means on Thursday. I think that's actually 9 30. I'll check. <laughs> So, good afternoon again. So, we're here to get that Equalized Pupil update, I believe. Um, when I was here last time, several weeks ago, um, I was talking about what was going on in terms of the ADM counts data coming into us and what's going on. Life has gotten much better, <laughs> okay? Uh, um, my stress level has gone down. Everybody else's stress level has gone down. We're not done yet, but we're, we're very close. Um, and I'll explain it. The numbers behind me are basically where we are right now. Um, I'm showing you the FY18 column here. Just, just look at the first one first. FY18 average day of membership ADM because that's where we're collecting and using the data right now. Last year it was 87,000, just over that, about 87,400. And at this point, we're about at just over 86,000. That's a lower number than I projected. This one, I was expecting it to be closer to, if I recall right, 86.5, 86.6, something like that. How close is that to accuracy? <clears throat> I, I think it's actually pretty accurate at this point. I'll, I'll, I'll come back. Yeah. Probably give or take 100 okay. is my guess. Um, maybe a few more, probably not a lot, I don't think. It seems low to me, but the reason it seems low to me, I'm going to do a quick diagram here, is because ADM has been doing this the last several years, you know, by, that's probably an eight or nine, ten year trend, something like that. And then with the passage of 
Act, what was it, Act 166, um, the pre-K? Yeah, universal pre-K, universal pre-K, yeah. Pre-K yeah. It did this. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And now it's doing this. And, and so, okay. it's, so it's a little bit difficult to project <laughs> what's going to happen. I spent yeah. quite a while. So and that I th- added a bunch of three and four year olds. It did. And then if we hadn't added the three and four year olds. We would have had a fairly good yeah. Yeah. curve going, I mean, for you guys, curve going down this yeah. way. It, it, was, it, was, it was working nicely and it was easy to project on. But that, that blip there, that two year blip, yeah. before it really started going down again, makes it difficult. So I worked my way around trying to figure it out, and I think I overestimated high, which I don't prefer to do. I prefer to be low, because it's better to be low on your estimate than on high. Um, then we can talk about all that. Mark had talked about that. We told you how the edit fund works a little bit, I think, in terms of equalized pupils. So anyway, we're down about, at the moment, 1,200. Um, when I had told business managers to talk to all their people, I told you the IT people, who are submitting the data to us, not the, not the normal business manager, not the more <clears throat> school registrar. It was, it was IT people who don't really know the data. Um, and they were having issues getting into our system. They would drop leading zeros. Who uses those? But we do, apparently, or the provider does, whoever. Um, so anyway, we're, we're down. But when I, when I told, I forgot what I was saying. When I told the business managers that I was going to, I wanted all the data in as best they could as of 4 o'clock yesterday. Um, our data team then got me the data. I went home and played with it, and everything looked hunky dory until I got to pre kindergarten. <clears throat> at which point, this was our 11th run, at which point pre kindergarten was down roughly 900 from our 10th run. <laughs> um, and, I, and I figured that's something on our side. So, so our, our data team are, are looking at that right now. They're going through it, figuring out what went wrong, because something went wrong, because pre K had been going up. So, what I did to get this number was I ignored what was in our system for this 11th run and I used a, what I expect to be a more correct run or number for from version 10. So so it's, it's kind of a composite. So these numbers aren't final, but I think they're at, at the point where we're getting pretty close, yeah. okay, which is good. <laughs> okay, so what, what's going to happen is once we get this issue resolved, one other district has some tuition students they're dealing with. I will then go in and I will freeze the equalization ratio, which we can talk about shortly. We'll just accept it for what it is at the moment. Um, I'm going to freeze the equalization ratio, and that way if somebody doesn't have any changes, their numbers won't change. But we still have some cleaning to do in the background, so some people who are claiming a student, two, two districts are claiming a student, only one can have them. Um, so things like that need to be resolved. So the numbers will fluctuate a little bit. So we're, we're not quite done. But it's very close, and I'm much happier than I was last time I was here. So when you put this all together, <clears throat> okay, and you calculate equalized pupils, what I'm coming up with, oh, I told Dan the wrong number, Dan French, I told him the wrong number because I couldn't remember. Um, when I calculated this year, it's, it, it's a two-year average, it's 87,800. That compares to about 88,300 last year, okay, for a difference of 502 or, or down. Okay, you, which is normal, we go, we go down. Um, this is using the hold harmless calculation. Okay. Okay, and, and again, we'll, we can come back to all these things can, shortly. Can you remind the committee how the hold harmless sure. works for the, our small schools? Sure. sure. Yeah. Just very, very briefly, what the law says is that when I calculate equalized pupils, you can't drop more than 3.5% of what your real calculation was the prior year. So if the prior year I calculated 100, and this year I calculate you at 90, you can't drop more than three and a half percent from the 100. So you'd have, you would have a count of 96 and a half. And that difference of 96 and a half to 90, that's six and a half, those are the phantom pupils. Okay. I think I'm probably not the only one very distracted by the phantom pupils. <laughs> it's great stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so let me just finish here and then we'll talk about some more, but then, the actual calculation without hold harmless, so before I do the hold harmless calculation, the actual calculation is 88,200 last year. This year it's 87,100, okay? So it's, it's, it's lower than I expected it to be because I think this number, is, I think I overestimated this number, I think. Um, we're finding out. So that's a drop of about 1,000, which is really not out of place. That's 
kind of been the norm, but it was starting to slow off. It looks like it might have picked up again if that number's in the ballpark. The difference between the whole harmless count and the actual count are the phantom pupils, the ones who don't really exist. And this year, based on the numbers that I'm looking at right now, we have 691. Last year, we had 111. Okay, that is something doesn't strike me, but it might be right. I don't know. It just it seems odd to me because this number is more reminiscent of what we had four or five years ago, and it, the, the phantom count had been dropping a little bit. But I'm not sure what's going on out there. It, you know, it, generally speaking, at this point I know. Right now, I don't. But I'm starting to feel more comfortable with the numbers that you're seeing behind me at the moment. They're not finalized, but you know, business manager approves them right now. <laughs> I'm sure because I sent them out last night. Okay. So the whole decline, including phantom students, seems to be in the ballpark of one and a quarter to one and a half percent. Mm -hmm. So if hold harmless only kicks in for districts that have over three and a half percent, and the average is significantly lower than that, that would suggest that there are some districts that are losing a large percentage. Is that right? It, it's, it's, it could either be districts losing a large percentage, or it could just be a small percentage across the board, is, is, is what it could be. I mean, it's, and I, while I don't sit down and really look at what the percentage changes each year, the actual change from one year to the next, I mean, I can. I have the data. Um, some, I think, I think it's starting to slow off. The, well, I was expecting it to slow off, or to slow down the, the actual drop off. Um, this is this to me is suggesting otherwise. But again, it may be because I estimated incorrectly. Mm -hmm. You know, which which in turn is going to drive all the stuff down below it. You know, I, again, we haven't talked about equalized pupils are calculated, but it, but it's a two year average. But but that if if I was high back when I was doing this back for the December 1 letter, if I was high, then the equalized pupil count I used for the December 1 letter, letter was high. Mm -hmm. And that so and, and that's not where we want to be. It's actually better to be the other way, where I was low and it came in higher. It's, it's like it, the, the obverse of that is spending. You want me to come in to make my estimates to be high as opposed to low, so that when, when the yield is set, it's going to lower tax rates later on than what people initially think. And I'm not sure that's what's happening this year. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure I understand what we're looking at. Uh, sorry to drop it back to a very basic no. level. <laughs> this is not basic. Okay. So it feels basic. So to me, the, so the actual number of pupils is this, what I think it is. Okay. That's the actual number of pupils. Phantom pupils are the difference, basically, the gap. Once you say that, hey, schools, we're not going to let you drop more That's than 3.5%. Right. So they're fake. Yep. They're, they're what goes into that calculation. Right. And the whole harmless, the purpose of that is so that smaller schools, particularly if you lose 10 kids or something, you don't see a huge decline in funding? Yeah. It, well, no, no. No. Okay. There, there's something to, to stop right there. I'm missing just, something about... Well, well. Every, every, that, that's, that's what you just said. They're, they get less funding because of that is, is a common misperception. We don't fund based on kids, <clears throat> okay, regardless of how you count it. We fund based on what school districts say they're going to spend. Right. So when, when people right. have town meetings... Um, they vote on a budget, you have certain revenues that you know are coming in, you subtract those out, and you have what's called education spending. That's what we owe school districts. So kids haven't even come into the equation at that point. They have when they're building their budgets, but not in terms of state funding. So this doesn't have to do with state funding. What this is leading to, this equalized pupil number right here, what this is leading to is this is leading to how we calculate tax rates to raise the money for the mm -hmm. education fund. Yeah. And again, that's that's a longer conversation. Um, well, we've had that yeah, I, I, conversation. I, I, in here. I, I will tell you, it's a conversation you probably didn't have five or six times before okay. it starts making sense, regardless of how who says it. Okay. Yeah. Really. Remember, this this is this is complex. It's gone through a change last year, and so there there really aren't stupid questions here. No, there there aren't. You're probably asking a question for everybody. <laughs> Representative Jean Batista. Uh, can you remind the committee? Uh, ADM is a rolling average. No. Well, okay. yeah, yes, no, no, sort of yes. Okay. Um, How many eight, years? That's a good question. A average daily membership, ADM, is 
comes from a 20-day census period each fall. It's from the 11th day of school through the 30th day of school, that's your 20 days. And what the school district are doing is they're counting every student they publicly fund. If a student is there for the full 20 days and publicly funded, they are 180 m. If they're there for 15 of the days, they're 0.758 ADM. Okay, so it just works. So 10 days, you're, you're half an ADM. That, that's how it works. So it's just 20 day FTE. If you move the day after the 30th day, doesn't matter, but your, your ADM count doesn't change. Okay. It's, so you're it's supposed to be not being day. counted during flu season. Yes, <laughs> exactly. But, but actually, actually, no, they don't need to be enrolled. in school, they just have to be enrolled. Yeah. So they, they can all be out sick, <laughs> and that, that's all fine. But they, but they have to be they have to be enrolled in school is what they have to be. You're going you're you're going to equalize pupils, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which is which is what it, ADM goes into actual. Then we did the whole terms and put them backwards intentionally. But so when when we're now talking about equalized pupils, and we can run through equalized pupils. I don't think you have time to do that today. But I will happily come back and run you through equalized pupils and watch your eyes spin. That's great. It's always fun. Um, but equalized pupils is a two year average of average daily membership. So it for what, what I'm doing equalized pupils right now for fiscal year 20 next year, I'm using this year's ADM and last year's ADM. I take that average, then I add state place students to it from the prior year. And so I now have my long-term average. I then apply weights for various categories. When such you, as? Such, such as, such okay. as secondary, which is an additional 13%. Um, poverty, which is a calculation, it's 25% it's based on a ratio of, of your poverty count versus your, your count of kids. And then, um, okay. ELL. ELL, that's the one I was after. <laughs> ELL is another 20%. And then pre-K is deflated because they don't cost as much. The other three categories are presumed to cost more, so you get more weight because it's more expensive to have those kids. Pre-K is presumed to cost less, so you're, it's deflated by, by a 0.46 factor. Did you mention special ed? No, special ed is not a factor there because special ed is funded differently. It's, it's part of education spending. So it's but not it's weighted, but your special ed students are in your equalized people number, aren't they? Yes, they are. They're just weighted at one. They're just, or, they're, or they're, they're whatever they have to They're whatever they would happen to be, yeah. but there's not an IEP does not affect it relative yeah. to what yeah. you're. Because, because there's doing. additional money coming in from another funding source, yeah. in other source funding formula, the special ed formula. Just curious, um, since we've been on this downward trajectory of equalized peoples as well as ADM for a while, I'm just, it, it seems that as our, and I know in our district our superintendent has optimistically thought that maybe we're approaching a, a floor <laughs> with student population. Which district? Yeah, right. Uh, so what, let's just assume that's not true. Um, it, as it's going down, as I understand it, the, t the students that are weighted a little bit more, at least in one category, the secondary category, those class sizes are slightly bigger than the class sizes that are typically coming in. Not always, but okay. if your whole pro population is going down. So I'm just, it, it, is the ratio between ADM and equalized pupil changing in a predictable way as that pattern plays out? In other words, you can have the same ADM across a school district, but your equalized pupil number is actually getting tighter as the population leaves yeah. the school at the high end. Yeah. And I'm just thinking, I'm just wondering if you're seeing trends in those kind of two lines. It, it's, it's a good question. I haven't looked at it that way. If I ever find time, I can and will, because it's interesting. You expect um, it, though, right? I, I, I kind of do, because there was a bolt that was going through the school system several years ago, and it's kind of worked its way out at this point, um, where, where what, exactly what you're seeing was you're seeing the egg going down the snake, and suddenly most of it's gone at this point in most districts. Um, I just kind of took a quick look statewide, and it looks like the elementary grades up through maybe, if I remember correctly, maybe through fifth grade, fourth grade are higher in aggregate than the fifth, sixth, and seventh grade, then it picks mm -hmm. back up for eighth, ninth, and tenth, and maybe eleventh and drops for twelfth. I think eleventh starts to drop too a little bit. I'm going off the top of my head, I don't really know for sure. But it's, 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 it's a funny thing, when you look at it over time, it's, it's you know, you, can kind of, you could kind of see that bulge going through. It wasn't giant by any means, but it was bulge. But in general, the population is going up, not everywhere, um, but in general, the, the overall state population is going down. Hmm. Um, That's interesting. I wonder how birth rates in the 
discussion. Mm. Interact. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah, we're actually, that was, when we really hit Vermont, it was 2009 and 10, I think, when we really hit Vermont, we started seeing it here. So it was a couple years after this, this the um, rest of the country. So say 10, 11, you know, we'd, we'd be seeing those kids yeah. either coming or not coming in. About 10 years so, ago, fifth grade now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Representative Jim Batista? Just one other question on waiting while we're talking about that. So if, if we look at changing the weights in the future, how difficult would that make your calculation of ADM projections? Because you described we had a trend, we added pre-K, the trend changed, and now it's coming back. Wouldn't changes to weights in the future add a level of uncertainty to your projections? No. Okay. And, and, and the reason because is there's no weighting involved with ADM. Okay. I see. No. The, the, okay. the weights so are applied to, to a, yes, the okay. weights are applied to ADM yeah. to get the equalized number. It would change my projection now because when I do this, I'm projecting both, yeah. I'm trying to get them to converge. Right. You know, as as I'm doing the other work, then throwing numbers in, trying to get both sides to come in, so I get what I'm hoping is right. Mm, apparently, it may not be this year, um, but so it's so it's not going to affect that in terms of the equalized pupils projecting that it would. However, it's kind of a zero sum game. As you if you change weighting factors, you increase say you increase secondary to twenty five percent, or you increase poverty to thirty percent, you increase ELL to twenty five percent. What that means is those districts that have higher proportions of them have a higher pupil count, and it means those districts that don't have as high proportion have a lower pupil count. The sum total is pretty much the right. same I, before hold harmless. That that's what where it changes, but that will wash itself out after a year because the change in the formula. So that. In order to model it, it's very easy because I, the way the spreadsheet set up, I, I want to change that number. I just type in a new number and it goes right through the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that part's easy. Um, but predicting what's going to happen <coughs> is a little, you know, the future is a little harder. So is there a place where you're just going to freeze it? Or yes. Know? Yes. Um, when we get our problem solved, I guess is probably the best way to put it. Um, when we get our problem solved with the pre-K, um, I, will, I will run it through and I will take the data and I will tell people I'm freezing it, this is it, and I'm, freeze, I'm not freezing the data per se, but I'm freezing the equalization ratio. And the equalization ratio, since we talked a little bit about what's happening in the equalized pupil calculation, the equalization ratio is used to take that um, that really, that, that big number, when, when you've added the weights to the two-year average, you now have too many kids in there, to bring the whole number back down to what it should be for the state. That's called the equalization ratio. It's about 94.8% right now, 94.7%, something like that. I will freeze that. Yeah. And then once that's frozen, anybody who doesn't have a change because of cleaning in the background, or, or oops, I forgot to count, you know, those 15 kids who are tuitioning out here, which happens occasionally. Um, no, th those people who aren't having any issues like that will not have their number changed, it's done. The people who have minor changes will, that, that ratio will not change, they'll be able to figure out what it's going to be. But we're not gonna keep making changes that much longer. I, I just, at this point, I would say probably Within two weeks, we will be completely done. I think it could be closer to a week. Um, but but I, the the woman who's doing the check for the um, what went wrong in the system is working on it now. She's out in the field doing stuff tomorrow, so it'll be Thursday before we can really connect again to see what happened. And so I think I think I really think we'll probably finalize things next week. Is is really my anticipation. So just going forward, um, the Ways and Means Committee will be using the data that you you have. They will be setting the yield sometime in third week of March or second week in March. We will pass that. It will then go to the Senate. Budgets will come in. Mm -hmm. They will have a more they'll have, they'll have more accurate information, close information, and then then it will come back and, and they will they will set the yield and then we'll, we'll agree on that. So so all in all, this has just been challenging for the school districts who are trying to uh, calculate. It, 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 ha it has been, um, and, it's, and it's hard for them because they're talking to their voters shortly, you know, in town meeting, and they don't they don't have they don't have finalization on a lot of these things. So it it, it is a difficult process for them, um, and I and I understand that. 
So that's why we're trying to get things done as soon as possible. Um, but we, by the same token, we want to be as accurate as possible too. And we will certainly have an after-action discussion yeah. <laughs> once, yeah. once this is all over and figure out what you know what what's fixed, what went wrong here, and with people in the field too, not just internally, but with people in the field too. Um, to see what's going on, make sure that these problems are resolved so we don't come anywhere near to this point next year. Right. Um, and this is separate from the SLDS, correct? No, this is actually coming in through the SLDS. Is yes, this is, this is coming in through the SLDS. The SLDS system itself is working internally. It's getting, it's people who don't know the data trying to get it to bring it in so that it gets pulled into the SLDS correctly where the, where the problem is. Um, and even, my guess is, even if you had people who knew the data, they would have troubles trying, trying to get things to, to move in. I, I think it's, a lot of it's what normally happens in the first year of a new process. Things just do not work smoothly. This is just, they're you know, bumping these in, even in the right word for this one. This is, you know, the Himalayas. Um, but that's and they're basically of, three that you're waiting for? That? No, pretty much everybody is now in, all the districts are in. Um, when I last, I did a run on the 7th, that was run 10, so whatever the 7th was uh, last week, um, I noticed that St. Johnsbury, their public student census, which was a big, big count, had dropped out. And it's because the person had gone and changed something, and when they put it back in, there was some leading zero that was gone. <laughs> um, and so nobody recognized until I looked at them and said, whoops, something's not right here. Then there were a couple other districts that, that they knew their, their kindergartners weren't in, they knew their pre-K weren't in. Those are all in now, okay? The problem we had was somewhere on our end this time with the, the um, pre-K count, and so that, that will be resolved. And at that point, I didn't see any other big changes out, really outside of that, except the ones I expected that were gonna come up. But there were no big fluctuations like I've been seeing in the past with districts now. So everybody's in, everybody is there, and. You know, we're we're now doing the um, finalization, and kind of that's kind of where it stands. Any questions? So sometimes you want to go over equalized pupils when you have a little bit of time, and and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and you're awake and you want to be mystified. I will happily come back. Um, well, Seth always okay. done a little bit of that with us. Okay. Fortunately, so so we. we we, are, we have been primed. Okay. <laughs> that works out. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. For the record. For the record, my name is Representative Barbara Rachelson. I represent part of Wilmington. And I um, introduced H-185. Um, it's nice to be in the new expanded education committee room. When I served on the ed committee, it was the... Uh, course class, so this is lovely. I hope you all appreciate the spaciousness of this room. Um, so I was approached by Jean Robles, who's a graduate student at UVM, and here today um, to say a few words to you also. Um, Jean approached me to introduce a bill um, much like the one that California passed. So in 2013, California became the first state in the nation to ensure rights to uh, transgender students. Um, so Jean helped work on this draft um, based on both the California law um, as well as model law and a document that the Agency of Education um, has produced called Best Practices for Transgender Students. So H-185, a bill to um, provide um, student rights to transgender and gender non-conforming students would provide students with access to gender segregated school programs, activities and facilities that are consistent with the individual's gender identity regardless of their um, assigned sex at birth. And it would be, um, in this draft, it would be um, uh, used for any student enrolled in a Vermont public or independent school, and it would allow them to participate in gender segregated school programs and activities, such as athletic teams and competitions, um, facilities, um, 
also it would allow students to list on their record um, their gender identity as well, in, as opposed to their gender at birth. And it would encourage um, teachers and other staff to address students by name and pronoun corresponding to their gender identity and also um, not disclose that information except for as required by law. Um, and last, it would allow schools, it would have schools encourage and allow teachers, staff, and other students to identify their sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression on any forms used to collect that demographic data as appropriate. So today, Jean is here um, with us, as is Kate German from UVM, and they'd love to say a few words about the importance of this bill and how it can make a real difference for so many students in our state. So I can Great. pull up a chair and go back. So we have so we Jean? Jean, yeah. So for the record, can you give us your name? Yeah, so my name is Jean Robles, um, and I just made a script, so I don't miss anything. It's fine. Okay, it's my first time here. So, hi everybody, my name is Jean Robles. I use they, them pronouns, and I identify as genderqueer and transmasculine. Um, I'm a grad student at UVM in the Higher Education Student Affairs Program here. Um, and so last year, the Trump administration released a memo which would define gender as a biological immutable condition determined by genitalia at birth. And this definition would erase trans individuals. So if the federal government defines gender in this way, trans people will be unable to go to the federal government for civil rights protections. Um, trans people will be unable to change federal documents to align with their gender identity. And trans people's citizenship will be fragmented because our rights will maybe be recognized at the state or institutional level, but not at the federal level. So um, trans rights are human rights, and as a state that has led in queer and trans rights, we should act. The state of Vermont and UVM currently protects trans students from dis discrimination based on gender identity and expression, uh, but trans students continue to face obstacles because of their identity. Um, and the 2017 <coughs> Vermont Youth Risk, Youth Risk Behavior Survey showed that queer and trans students were two times more likely than straight cisgender students to experience bullying in the past month, um, four times more likely than straight cisgender students to hurt themselves and attempt suicide. And these data match trends at a national level. So this bill would show the, this bill would show the state's support towards trans students being able to fully exist as themselves at school through the acknowledgement of their identities, access to facilities, and also assessment um, by collecting the demographic data. Um, and for me personally, I came here from Iowa. I'm just a grad student here. Um, but I was able to transition emotionally and physically as a gender queer and trans masculine person because of the support systems here. And there's a lot more trans people identifying more openly in the state of Vermont. I also was able to transition because of the, the structured student health insurance here on um, campus resources. So Vermont is a good place. And this bill would just like tell students that like we care about them as a state, um, especially in our political like national climate. And just wanted to thank Wendy and Kate for and Barbara for supporting me through these two years that I've been here um, in Vermont. So you have experienced um, support at UVM. Yes, for sure. Good to hear. <laughs> <laughs> it's rather more such disturbing news, so it's nice to hear that you've had that experience. Yes. Questions. So hi. Um, I just have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. One is, and I don't know how to say this, but mm -hmm. I feel like with the sports teams that it's not just gender, but it's also muscle. Do you know what I mean? And how does that, in terms of, that's why we have um, men's sports and women's sports. Women don't compete against men because just men are built physically differently. So how would that be equal to students? Do, do you know what I mean? That if there was a trans that went, was, um, let's say a woman or a man that went up to be a woman and then competed on women's teams, would that be equitable in terms of the strength 
of that person, you know, in terms of their capacity as an athlete. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, so there's been this talk for a while, and actually there's some schools that have, like, supported trans individuals, especially in Harvard, if you've heard of, um, there's a swimmer who's transgender who um, was female, signed up birth, but the school let them compete. Um, and is it okay if I ask like the other constituent too to for to help me answer this? For question? here, but yeah. What we can we can do is uh, maybe just re ask your question again, and, or we can get to all once we've sort of heard from everybody yeah. individually. Yeah. You understand so we'll, what I'm asking? Yeah. And the, yeah. Okay. So so what we'll do is just get everybody through, and I think that's what we'll do, and then we'll just get questions to everybody at the same okay. time. Then we'll so put in one person, you know, on <laughs> yeah. the Yeah. Answer for everybody in the room. If they're like researcher, or if they're doing policies or whatever, you know. So we'll get to that with everybody. Okay. Perfect. So the, the next one is Kate. Hi, Hi Kate. <laughs> um, I'm Kate German. I'm the director of the Prism Center at UVM. We serve queer and trans students on campus and focus on making campus a more equitable place for lesbian, gay, for people of all sexual orientations and gender identities. Um, I came today in support of Jean and also because I think the, um, this bill is really important. I've been watching what's been going on around the, the country um, in terms of support for trans students. And what California did was really um, groundbreaking at the time. I think um, this bill for Vermont makes a lot of sense because um, in a way it uh, enshrines what the practice is most commonly here, um, but also takes a middle ground compared to what California did and encourages or suggests um, some things start happening at the school level but doesn't require it. California went straight ahead and required things and so there have been some massive infrastructure changes there. Um, this bill doesn't go as far so I think it's easier for schools um, and it just makes sense for us here. I think um, one of the things that, um, that we see on campus is a lot of um, goodwill and intention to support students, um, but when it comes down to it, people have questions about structure, and like what can we do and what can't we do when a student's um, gender identity or their expression, kind of how they're showing up day to day is different than what's on their legal records. Um, and as we approach each of those hurdles, we've um, figured out where some of those um, where the lines are, and I think the bill does a good job of making it really clear to folks um, in schools at all levels that really, as a daily practice, um, it is appropriate to call someone by the name that they're requesting to be made, uh, to be called. Um, it is appropriate to use the pronouns that they ask to be referred to by, um, and which usually match their um, gender presentation. And it is appropriate to let people have access to the facilities that match their um, their gender identity and expression and I can speak a little bit to the sports teams question but first I want to say you know most commonly this stuff comes up around um, facilities and so um, you know you yeah it's more about facilities and access like um, if a student is uh, presenting as a, a boy and a boy in kind of every aspect of their life except for um, their uh, legal sex on their records, of course it is safer for them and for everyone else for them to be using um, the boys' restroom, um, to be competing on boys' teams. It really um, is dangerous for that student to be forced to compete on female teams or to be a part of um, programs for women when they're clearly not uh, presenting as a young woman. Um, so to the question about sports teams, um, we've seen this addressed uh, at a lot of different levels. The, um, I'm actually not a sports fan, so I can't say <laughs> where UVM's teams fall in all of the, um, the competitions and things, but I know at the NCAA level, um, there are best practices and rules now about allowing trans students to mm -hmm. compete, and um, I, at most levels now, we're seeing the um, sports association saying it's appropriate to affirm the gender that the person is presenting as. Um, a lot of what we um, have been told or think we know about um, biology and the, um, the way that hormones affect how people compete uh, 
doesn't turn out to be true at that level. Um, I think uh, the Olympics might be the one exception, but when you're competing at the college level, um, it's appropriate for people to be uh, on the gender-specific team that they're presenting as. Um, but really, younger than that, um, we're not talking about people who are taking a lot of medical steps towards transition, so it's much less of an issue. It's really about their safety and comfort um, and affirmation from their peer group that they belong on that team. Um, there's really not much of an imbalance for uh, younger students, for people to be competing like that, if that makes sense. Questions? Representative James. I just had a couple of questions. Um, so you had mentioned that this bill is um, perhaps doesn't go as far as the legislation in California. Is that in the use of the word "shall be"? So, in other words, it's encouraged. Is the I'm looking at the bill. Is it is it the "shall" that? Um, I was referring to the data, the demographics. I think yeah, I think she, um, part C. Um, those are encouraged. Yeah. That's so I'm up, yeah. um, I'm sorry, I'm up on line, um, on the first page, line 19. Line 19. I'm just wondering um, how much, be how much leeway you've left um, for schools that might try to not comply. That's a good question. I don't think I, I, I don't know if that would happen, that. but I, I'm right. just wondering. Yeah. If it was may be permitted, wouldn't they leave it up to the school? I guess that's what I'm asking. So well, they did. Like it should happen. Yeah. 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 Okay. You so you feel the language is strong enough. I mean, I deferred a lot. Jean did a lot of research on it, and both in talking to Kate and at looking at um, lots of different documents, including the AOE document. I mean, I think. I would feel great if the committee took it up and you know made a determination is it strong enough um, because we would want to have everybody opt out of like oh that's nice but we're not going to do that here we're too small or I guess so. that was my question yeah um, I don't see that this bill speaks uh, and, and that's okay I'm just seeing so it, it, it speaks to the being able to use facilities consistent with the individual's gender identity irrespective of the gender listed on the student's records. Just thinking that with the um, secondary age uh, student population, we may have um, certain, well, in anywhere in society, maybe especially in that age group, we might have students who are non-binary, students who are questioning, mm -hmm. and I don't see that this bill kind of speaks to the availability of non-gender specific facilities, but I'm just kind of curious if that's something you've, you've thought about. <clears throat> it's a, I think you're raising a great point. Um, I think, yeah, again, it would be great to have the committee look at that. Um, I know that we always like to do things incrementally here, so this seems important, but I think that could also help a lot of students feel legitimized and listened to. And I do, as a social worker, I am worried about, um, as a society, how we can normalize things for kids that are trying to figure it out and not feel like they have to keep it as a deep, dark secret. Because well, and I would just follow up by just saying that it occurs to me that, you know, in, in a time, really, I, I support this initiative and I'm glad to see the bill in front of us. Um, it is also a really challenging time with many facilities budgets generally in Vermont schools. And I was just thinking that the um, re-identification of a, of say, a, a, a facility, whether it's a, a bathroom or another facility, into a gender neutral facility uh, may be more um, something that can be expedited more quickly right. without necessarily requiring new construction and it just might be so just something to consider that as we move forward on this that that's kind of the nature of one of the things that and and really the other allowing facilities to be consistent with the individual's gender identity that shouldn't require new construction either right it's just that I think having an additional piece in there um, may be helpful mm -hmm. it is 
as schools were looking at using money for safety, I mean, kids are going to be safer if they Absolutely. are able to sort of be in the right spot. And thinking about um, what happens, you know, some of the incidents that have happened around, around the country, for younger students, mm -hmm. often what we see now is that, um, you know, a, a young person might be assigned, for example, might be assigned male at birth, um, realizes that that's not true for them um, and that their gender is female and is raised by their family as female, um, but maybe at that point doesn't have their records changed, so they enter school as, as female um, and need to be, um, it's, it would be safer for them to be recognized as female and to be treated as such. Um, but if the school, if an employee in the school has access to, to a record saying that that's not that child's um, sex at birth and outs that student, um, that that's where the safety issue comes in. It's actually, um, or tries to prevent that student from participating fully in school life, um, you know, the way that the child is trying, that student is trying to be recognized. So, um, yeah, when you think about safety issues, it's much more of that outing or trying to stop people from participating in the, you know, fully in the um, activities of the campus or the school that um, is more worrying than um, than kind of the reverse. Do we um, have any data on schools that are doing well with this already or not well with this already? Do we have any data? Um, it's heartening to me that there are no, we haven't had any lawsuits in Vermont or people trying to be kept out of um, their school activities. And so in some ways it's kind of the absence of really of glaring problems. It's really, um, I don't want to say common, but you hear, you know, there are, it happens, um, I mean that's how we know in other states there are a lot of issues and it often happens district by district and so, um, yeah. Harder. And there was a program on um, Vermont Edition. Oh, gosh, I don't know. It must have been. I feel like it was. It's before you and I had the conversation about this, so I think it was in the fall or the summer. And people were calling in. A lot of parents were calling in from all over the state and talking about sort of the lack of resources in parts of Vermont and just how isolated their children were. And so again school could be one of the places where there could be support and validation that, that could truly make a difference. I mean, that's not to say that Chittenden County or, you know, Rutland are doing great because they're bigger areas, because obviously we still have our challenges, but it's, it's um, tough to be a kid, period, right now, let alone add in, you know, something that is still not widely understood by others. So. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to add that last point on the um, point C about the data. Um, just because um, we want schools to collect this demographic information so that they could do some analysis based on queer and trans student identities and then like how, how the students are doing grade-wise, how the students are doing behavioral-wise just like they do with other demographic information that they already collect, like race or disability. Because um, that's what California also started to do at their schools. They just started collecting the data this past um, fall um, so that they could look at retention rates and like look how look at how students are actually doing. Because without the, without the data, we can't really say much because we we're not like counting the students as um, part of like our population. Okay. My question did relate to that passage you were just discussing. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't fully understand, I didn't think the intent of that passage or what challenge or problem it was addressing. Could you just elaborate on that just a little bit more? On like why we would like to collect the data? Well, I like understand that? why you would like to collect the data. Is it mm -hmm. not currently collected or no. are people discouraged from it? It almost sounded like there was a problem you were specifically trying to address. And I don't think I know the, the problem. At the, um, at the higher education level, I would say the problem is, uh, so we don't collect the data um, currently. Uh, I know that's true for UVM. Um, in conversations I've had with some folks at state colleges, I believe that's true as well. A lot of the data collection at that level is driven by um, what has to be reported federally. And right now, 
uh, depending on the agency, um, it's either not being asked or you, you couldn't report it if you wanted to. So um, it encourages schools at this level to, um, to collect that information and do something with that information climate-wise. Um, at UVM, that's been really important because we happen to be um, doing a climate survey that launched actually last week, but um, the last one we did was in 2011. So until now, we haven't had any climate information really, um, any, any data to back it up, I would say, about um, how well uh, marginalized um, folks who hold marginalized sexual and gender identities are doing on campus. And this bill is intended to cover post-secondary as well as what, what grade levels are you guys aiming at here? I think it was K through um, I didn't see that. I might have missed it. I think it's K through. Is it K through 16? Like yeah. all the way through? I think it almost says K through 12, but so maybe that needs to be. I don't know if that by, yeah. by definition right. excluded right. those second so maybe, Right, so that is kind of vague. So this would not be post secondary. Well, I don't know. Like this. Right. Yeah. So we can ask, we can check with Jim. But you're, you're looking at this as pre K 12, correct? We I thought you guys were hoping it would cover college, too. Yeah. yeah. So you, yeah. You're, you're so you might need to add that. Pre-K uh, to college. 16. Or, right yes. now, yes. it's pretty much pre-K 12. Pre-K 12 is easier than pre-K 16. So if that were a huge barrier, I guess. Or higher ed. It's, just, it's easier right. to separate them. Pretty short, Bill. <laughs> um, anything else? Central question. Yeah, but it, 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 might, it may not tie into the bill, but as a former EMT, um, one of the concerns I have is that if I come upon an accident and there's a trans person, mm -hmm. biologically, they're Different, and sometimes you're making really kind of split-second decisions. And I was wondering if there was ever a concern about having to identify in an emergency, you know, because of just physically there's a difference internally. They may, in terms of the kind of care that you could provide you, if they would provide the wrong care. Does that make sense? You know, that, that they would the intervention would be not correct and it could be unsafe. You know, I mean, because they're thinking of one gender, you know, biologically, you're another. Sounds like another bill for right. <laughs> I know. Uh, uh, I just wonder if that, I, I've always wondered if that's an issue or if there are, in, I mean, it's probably a one, you know, it's a very small percentage, but um, it's a, it was a concern of mine as an EMT. Um, I just, and I think it's a really thoughtful question, and I think um, it, it wouldn't be, um, yeah, I don't think it's it, not it, in this it bill, doesn't, right, yeah, yeah, it doesn't fall within yeah, this. it's not in the um, bill, but it is something just to think about. It's a dilemma, I mean, I can't, and to, again, it, it, you know, that certainly seems like a, a bill that could, um, percolate. I know that there was a bill last year about removing gender off of driver's licenses. Right. Yeah. Um, so, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, when I think about the health and wellness of this this student population, I think um, <laughs> the, the problem is in um, kind of, is in emergency situations like that. It's that when the EMTs show up, they refuse care when they discover they're working with a trans oh, person. Yeah, not that, um, that's not right, like that kind of level of discrimination or being told, you can't play, or you know, you can't, um, you can't use the bathroom in school. Good luck to you. Right. Um, so it's yeah, it's, it's those things that we're trying it's to protect making, against, you know, right? You know, safety or medical yeah. decisions in a very short amount of time, and maybe making a wrong assumption. But the yeah. daily challenges in terms of um, students' mental health. Oh, right. Which right. seems like Absolutely. we know that 
you know, this, the at-risk suicide data, like, is right. pretty just, clear, so. Right. It, the, the good would outweigh the bad, you know, even if. No, no, I'm not arguing yeah, against yeah, yeah. anything. Yeah. Just to find a I can see You guys can have that conversation outside, too. Okay. <laughs> um, does UVM have a policy? Um, specific to access to facilities? Yeah. Um, we have, so um, gender identity and expression are included in our non-discrimination policy. Um, athletics has policies by division, um, but promotes you can play. Um, and um, we don't have, for example, we don't have a, a policy about um, bathroom access, although we're working on a, an affirmative statement of folks being able to use the bathroom that feels appropriate and safe and comfortable to them. Um, but I think we have um, more actions in place, like we're already working on multi-user, um, gender-inclusive restrooms, and all the single-user, well, before it became the law, the single-user bathrooms got transitioned, things like that. Um, other things, like housing, are case-by-case -case basis. So you're in process, mm -hmm. working on it. Probably because you're there. <laughs> Always trying to improve. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. For the record, Katie McLean, Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, and I'm not often in this committee, so oh, hello to folks I haven't met before. Um, we're looking today at a bill on radon testing in school, but I thought I'd give you a little history lesson before we jump in and look at the language. So this is um, a concept that's been floating around uh, the building for several biennium. Um, last year, there was a version of this that was taken up in Senate education, and they took a lot of testimony, they did a lot of rewriting, and what is actually introduced in front of you today is <coughs> the version that the Senate Education Committee had worked on. So they never voted it out of committee, I think. Um, but this never made it prime time, it never made it to the floor, but this is... Well, actually, it ended up in the miscellaneous... And it was, was it vetoed? Is that what it happened? died in committee. It died in committee of conference. It was an S two something. Fifty seven. So it was two fifty seven. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So it ended up in the so, bill. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, there we go. So um, so anyway, this represents the work of the Senate Education Committee last year. Um, so first, we have in section one a definition section. We're creating a whole new chapter around radon testing in schools, and this is in Title eighteen, the health chapter. And we're defining facility to mean all or any part of a building in a school's campus that's deemed by the commissioner of health or his or her designee to be at high risk for elevated concentrations of radon. And then school means a public school or an independent school. The next section has to do with mandatory radon testing in schools. So this first paragraph, subsection A, um, directs the health department to perform radon tests on facilities of at least 40 schools annually and, and until each school has been tested. And then those schools that request a test can be among the first to receive a test from the health department. And the schools should be tested at least uh, once every 15 <coughs> years. The next section, subsection B, says that the health department is to provide the principal or the head of the school with all of the following information. First, the results of the school's radon test. Second, information on the level at which the EPA recommends taking action to reduce radon concentrations at school facilities. And third, information about the health effects of elevated radon concentrations on children and adults. So that information all goes to the head of the school. And then in subdivision B2, the principal or the head of the school is to share the test results and all of the information that's been defined provided by the Department of Health with parents, guardians, students, school employees, school volunteers, the school board, and any community <coughs> representatives regularly present at the school. The top of page three, there's language that any new school construction or expansion of an existing school is to attempt to use radon resistant new construction. The language in that section is interesting. If you look on line three, it says shall endeavor. So um, we have the shell, which is the strong, you must do it, but shell endeavor, that softens it a little bit. Um, 
Section two is the creation of a school radon mitigation study committee, and this committee is really focused at once the testing has been done and we know that a school potentially has radon, how do we pay to um, mitigate the radon? So we're creating this committee to explore funding opportunities for the mitigation of elevated radon concentrations in schools and contingency plans for the loss of related federal funding. And next in subsection B, we have membership of the committee, the state treasurer, secretary of education, commissioner of health, member appointed by the State School Boards Association, a member appointed by the Vermont Superintendents Association, a member appointed by the Vermont Independent Schools Association, and a radon mitigation professional certified for testing and mitigation by a national, the national radon proficiency program, who is appointed by the director of the Department of Labor's Workers Compensation and Safety Division. At the top of page four, says that the committee is to have the assistance of the Agency of Education to do this work, and there is to be a report on or before December 15th of this year, and the committee is to submit the report to this committee and to the Senate committee containing viable options for funding the mitigation of elevated radon concentrations in schools. In terms of meetings, the straight state treasurer or his or her designee is to call the first meeting by September 1st of this year, the committee is to select a chair from among its members at the first meeting, and the committee shall cease to exist on December 31st, 2019 of this year. Paragraph F has to do with uh, compensation and reimbursement. This is the standard language we use at the end of um, enacting legislation for committees. So this gives um, individuals who are not employees of the state and not otherwise compensated for their attendance at the meetings, uh, per diem compensation and reimbursement of expenses for up to four meetings. And this uh, money for these pay uh, payments would come from the appropriation to the Agency of Education. So this is really about testing but not mitigating. Not mitigating. Mm -hmm. Were you on that committee of conference? Yes. So does this sound like it was what? It was very similar yeah. language in some of it. Now, my question is, we, we had a school this summer that was tested and found to be, I don't know the correct terminology is, but there was a lot of radon. I'm not even sure where the school was. Um, and I'm trying to recall whether it, was, whether it was mitigated or not. I think it was, but I don't know what the cost was. Or, you have to find out where it was. I think it might have been somewhere in Rutland County. One of those marble schools. Oh, maybe. Was it on granite? Was it built on granite? I, I don't know. I can't remember. I'm sorry. I'm unfortunately not, not totally listening to No, I think they, I don't know. Which school it was? Yeah, no. Oh. Hmm. So, this starts with the testing of the testing of 40 schools, which is what they do already, is that correct? I don't believe they I do mean, test but 40 a year. I think the number that the health department is testing is much smaller than that. Okay, so they were looking to increase the number of schools, as I remember. Yeah. Um, this increases it, and it also has that um, timeline of 15 years, each 15 years, uh, a school is being tested. Would, there's not a findings section in this bill. Do you think they would have been last year? I'm just thinking we have, we have the lead um, abatement bill now and also had, had some tested recently for PFOAs. Mm -hmm. um, this seems like a, absolutely a good thing to test for. I know there's a certain amount of radon testing that sounds like it already happens. I guess I'm just looking for what's the upshot of this in terms of um, appropriation of any or additional, you know, capacity needs from the agency. And could we expect to see that supported by some more findings? I guess I'm just not in a position to ha have a sense how, I'm not trying to minimize it, it's just there's not information showing to show like how compelling or urgent 
this issue is to kind of add to the list of initiatives and, and boards. So is that information available? That's something that, that we could probably use data from the health department. No, we need to talk about that. So the version in, introduced last biennium did have findings. It did? It. Okay, so I could refer to that. And that originated in the Senate? I believe so. At 257? Mm -hmm. uh, 257 is where it ended up. Yeah, it ended up. It but that might have findings. It was a standalone bill. Yeah. yeah, it was started as a standalone bill. Nice I think it was in the house. Is it in the house? We, yeah. Did you it have? Made it was in the house. Well, it could be that there were companion bills. That's often the right. case. And yeah. you have matching bills, and then one moves in one body. Oh, that yeah. might have been a special yeah. session. It looks like it was S-279. 279. And 257 is where it ended up in the committee of conference. Because I just, I just pulled that up. Yeah, um, up too. The findings. Okay, there we go. Let's see, it's 257. Where did you find this? Uh, I get that in the 2017 2018 session under S279. 279. So we obviously have some work to do, <laughs> mm -hmm. some background work. Is there anything else we need from, from Ledge Council? Just is there anything about new construction? Because isn't there like a way to mitigate the radon if it is found eventually? I mean, oh, yeah. that you can put a pipe in, it's much cheaper than having to like with new construction. Well, our, our real estate agent here can tell you because you've had to deal with radon right. mitigation, yeah. right? It's like 1500 bucks put a radon right. mitigation system right. in. But when we build our new construction houses, we already retrofit it with radon pipe to be there. Right. So that I was wondering for new construction of schools, you know, if, if that should just be a standard thing. Well, I, I would certainly hope so. <laughs> Do you think so? Do you think that's in new construction of schools, that they just put that pipe in just in case? It's a lot more than just putting a pipe in. Yeah, so. it is. And it's yeah. also it goes underneath the whole floor. With a big school, it's going to be in some rooms and not in other rooms. A lot of gymnasiums. Yeah, we have just to a lot to do it. I'm just wondering about the makeup of the committee and who does yeah. what. <laughs> On the, the study committee, it's less the agency of education is providing staff support, but the treasurer is chairing it. It just seems like an odd arrangement of leader and, and staff support because they're separate. A quick correction. So yeah, if you look at, um, let's see, subsection E, the treasurer is calling the first meeting, but then in subdivision two, the committee is selecting a chair. So it's not necessarily the treasurer. Okay. Does it say anything about how, sorry. Does it say anything about testing itself? Um, like the longer term ones, like nine month testing instead of like a 48 hour test like we do in real estate? Well, not in the findings, no. Okay. And then just the other question I have. So the Department of Health was the primary witness that we heard from in the previous mm -hmm. biennium. They had a program manager, I think, and then a policy person. Um, I'm also just wondering, I mean, what did the person who had this drafted look at whether the health department was more appropriate than the agency of education or otherwise in terms of providing staff support? Did that come up? I, that would probably be a great question for your witnesses. Yeah. I don't remember it coming up um, last year. Okay. Just something to look at. Yeah, I'm looking at their, their testimony from last year, which is, which is very good. And in retrospect, I think it might have been helpful to have gotten her in first. Um, <clears throat> But um, anything else in terms of just the, the legal drafting? We're going to be changing it, I'm sure. Um, and just can you remind me, in terms of the way we draft, which are the things up here? Because we also have a lead, a lead bill coming mm -hmm. over from the Senate, and I wasn't sure if these might be able to be put together in some way. Okay. Um, is it the statement of purpose that can't be changed, or is it the subject? Uh, we generally don't change either. We, could, yeah. we generally um, say that those are. Oh, if the act, okay, if the, an act, is that the part that we don't change? You definitely can't change? An act relating to radon testing in schools, that we can change to reflect if the bill changes. Okay. I mean, we wouldn't change it to, um, for partisan reason, but we would right. change it to reflect the accuracy of what's in the bill. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, 
Thank you. Um, we clearly have to work to see you. Nice to see you as well.